Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on accelerating market adoption and use of data by smallholders. Uh, this webinar is the third webinar of a series that we started a couple of months ago. And this, where this uh, webinar series is facilitated by the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation and is co-convened with the Global Open Data for Agricultural and Nutrition Initiative and with the Technical Center for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation, CTA. Um, the series is a follow-up on a four-day training course that we had in Centurion in South Africa in November, where we discussed several aspects of farmers' access to data. We already have had two webinars in this series. The first one provided an overview of digital agriculture, and it was presented by the same person we have here today, Dan Byrne. And the second one was more about uh, the data, specific types of data needed by farmers and potential sources of data. This third webinar today uh, will examine some of the key challenges that are blocking adoption of digital agriculture by small, small order farmers. And we'll also examine how to ensure farmer centric data solutions. Our presenter, some of you may already know him because he presented our first webinar. Uh, his name is Dan Byrne. He is a professional business growth strategist with over 30 years of experience. And in particular, he's an expert in the irrigation sector he worked for the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance in the U.S., where he led um, an effort to create an agricultural irrigation market strategy. And Dan also serves as the project manager of a project ma managed by Ag Gateway, which is called Precision Agriculture Irrigation Language Data Standards. Uh, Dan, I'm now going to give the floor to you. Oh, there is another person with us today, uh, Charles Plummer from the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation as well and he's helping us with, with the webinar and he will take the questions for our presenter. So now the floor to Dan Byrne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Valeria. Thanks, Charles. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. And mm -hmm. um, today what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the potential, uh, we're going to quickly review the potential of digital agriculture. We went over this in the first webinar. And then, as Valeria said, the key challenge is blocking adoption. Uh, we, we're going to look at how, what are ways that we can use to ensure that the, the uh, data solutions that come out are farmer-centric and working for, for you if you're a farmer. And then how can you work with data providers to map your data needs for, for maximum value? And we'll get pretty specific about that and creating some small steps to success. Uh, we'll talk a bit about creating market position and higher v value because I know that's something that um, several of you have uh, expressed interest in. And then we'll briefly look at what is the market model for digital ag agriculture after we, we look through all this. And so that's what's on tap for uh, today. So as we said in, in our first w webinar, data-driven agriculture is really about the thoughtful use of big data to supplement on farm precision agriculture. And it really means getting the right farm data. And this is really crucial is you can be overwhelmed uh, with data. Uh, and whether you're a big farm or a small farm or somewhere in between, you can just get inundated with more data than what you know what to, what, what to do to it. So the idea is to get the right farm data when you need it to make better de de decisions. And so what you do with the data is what counts. Our goal in doing these uh, webinars and, and, the, and the whole process uh, that GFAR has set up is to really allow agripreneurs to be more successful from uh, just managing maybe your, your plot to, to managing your field and then on up to managing your farm and finally treating that as a business and becoming a profitable owner of a sustainable business and running that business in a sustainable way. We want to look at part of the, the the point of these series is to say, well, you know, if we let things go as, as they are over time, maybe our progress lines looks a bit like this this gray line down here at, at the bottom. But if we can do some things, maybe then we can accelerate how we are transforming that, that market and uh, look at putting some things in place that that really gives you more ability to be profitable in a in a sooner amount of time. We looked at this slide from the first uh, webinar, so we won't go through a whole lot of it, but just, again, a reminder that the amount of digitization, the use of data is really accelerating 
um, as we go through uh, time. And so we started out with just having, you know, maybe a tractor or, or whatever equipment you're using to that being a smart product, making that connected. Uh, sometimes that's connected with um, uh, a company if you're sending them uh, data and, and then really becoming a whole system uh, that's being used to connect all these different systems together. And there's a lot of potential benefits uh, if we get this data and we can make it mobile and connect it. You can get integration of sensor and field weather data. You can get real-time access to fixed assets that you have, regardless of your brand. Uh, so maybe you're using di different types of branding equipment. Now, obviously, these benefits that I'm showing here go way up uh, because if you're running a very large farm, uh, and particularly if you're running a large farm in the developed world, then these begin to, to really begin to, to take shape. And the point of this is that a lot of the industry is focused on creating solutions that sort of fit, fit this picture. They are trying to uh, create more integrated, connected, um, products and services that tie together what's going on in the field to what's going on in your uh, farm office to what's going on in the supply chain and trying to pull all this to, to together and as we mentioned in the first webinar there's a lot of aggregation of companies so there's mergers and acquisitions going on because a lot of the, the companies take are trying to move towards a picture that looks like this so we'll look and say, so what does that mean for you if you're a smallholder farmer? Uh, so if you are a smallholder, smallholder farmer, there's what we call a danga to, to be crossed. Now, the word danga came up during our uh, training session uh, uh, when we were in Centurion, and it was a new word to me. Um, I'm, I'm trained uh, in one of the, um, a person called Jeffrey Moore, who's written several books about uh, technology adoption and how does that change across the market life cycle. And he's got a famous phrase that he calls crossing a, a chasm. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. And uh, I, I discovered or was taught that uh, Donga would be an appropriate term uh, that would sort of mean this similar thing. So there's, there's some things that need to take place uh, that some of which are in a farmer's control and some which are not. But some things need to be in place if we're going to see the benefits of farmers adopting the use of data adopt, and then getting uh, full benefit from digital agriculture. So again, we, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about this, this idea about a, a, a donga that, that exists. So this is a model, this is a very simp simple model. It's, uh, it's called a technology adoption. Uh, model. Some people call it a, a technology market model. There's various names. Comes out of um, various researchers like Clayton Christensen and Jeffrey Moore. Don't worry about that. The idea is that when companies create products, uh, they really often, particularly te technology products, they really look to what they call early adopters and, and visionaries who just love technology and they can't wait to, uh, to use it. And, but most farmers are, are over here in a marketplace where we call they are pragmatists and they want something that works that is clear benefit to, to, to them. And if you're not creating a product that fits the needs of someone who's looking at it very pragmatically, has to work for them, has to provide some clear ben benefit, then that product might not go anywhere. And it falls into what Jeffrey Moore would call a chasm, what we're gonna call a donga. And we'll talk now a bit more about how that model works. So this is, the, this is an extended version of Jeffrey Moore's model at, um, that I get from my friends at, the, um, uh, at his tr training group. Uh, and this is, um, the idea here is that all products are created in what we call the early mar market, all new technology pr products. So this model is looking at how precision egg products span across the tech market model in the developed world. And what this means is simple, simply this. If you have a product that's brand new and no one's using it, well, it's clear to a few, few people who really love, as I said, new, new technology. And they might say, wow, 
you have these irrigation networks that are all c connected or field robotics. Oh, that's really cool. Or variable rate irrigation. Oh, I can't wait to get my hands on that. Or, oh, drones? Are you kidding me? I want a drone. So very, very enthusiastic people. That's great. But we have a uh, what Jeffrey Moore calls a, a bowling alley, and we'll get more into that in a second. This is where you have to get your products to work if you want farmers to originally adopt them. And so uh, something that farmers can see as pr pragmatic, that has been proven, that maybe there's a good brand behind it and is working. So some of the products that are being sold that fit this part of the phase of the market model are things like sensors that you use in the ground, uh, variable rate seeding, uh, using some satellite imagery, whether you get that uh, from a private provider or you go to an o open source, and a bit of data analytics, a little bit of saying, here's, here's the data, can you analyze it, please? Now, I will say that there's a lot of data analytics, analytics going on that don't always result in decision making. Then once, once you have this being start to be adopted by, but by farmers, then a larger market begins to adopt it and um, uh, it becomes more mainstream, let's say, out in the market. And so, so finally you get to things like uh, whether it's seeds or uh, irrigation systems or combines or tractors, pretty much everyone goes and they buy them on price, right? So things are very expensive because they're new and have a lot of investment in them in the early market still sort of be kind of expensive here in the in the bowling alley until, until they get more people to, to hook on and buy this time because they're trying to provide a specific advantage. By the time you get out here into a maturing market, people are buying on price. And we're going to talk about this later because it'll also have to do with how you position your products as, as a farmer as well. So just talk a little bit more about this idea about a, a bowling alley. Now I know when I talked about this in Centuria, people gave me a very quizzical look and said, what is bowling? I never heard of this. So it's a popular game in the US and you roll a ball down a wooden alley. And the idea is that, oh, now you can't see the, the let me see, can't quite see the other um, idea over here because my face is in front of it. But the bowling ball hits a number of what we call these pins. And there are 10, 10 pins and the bowling ball knocks them down and the idea is that one pin knocks down another pin, which knocks down another pin, which knocks down another pin. Here's the, here's the analogy, here's the metaphor. Each of those pins can be thought of as a market niche. So it could be a niche by crop type, it could be a niche by uh, area, uh, geography, it could be a niche that you're defining by size of the farm that's, that's, that's being done. And so the idea is that if you're a manufacturer, you want to create technology products that address a particular market with your new tech technology. And that you focus on one area and you solve their problem as best you, you can. You don't spend a lot of time there because you move to the next one. And, and at some point we can do a whole webinar on this as well. But solutions have to be that come into the bowling alley. And this is what's important for you all is the solutions or offerings must be solution oriented and whole product. What do we mean by whole product? By whole product, I mean if someone gives you say, here's my latest digital agricultural product for a year. Here's a great set of data, data solutions. If they do not provide you with training, with documentation, with everything that you need to know in order to use their product, that is not a whole product and you may abandon it. So if you're working with a pro pro provider and they're not giving you all the support that, that you need, you need to sort of point that out, out to them and they need to come up with a plan to give you what it is that, that you need. So again, we got across this, this, this donga and there's other challenges with, with that we have specific with smallholder farmers with access, funding, and use of data. So we, we, we can sort of divide this into four areas. 
uh, on the policy side, we uh, Stefan in the webinar two talked about the fair data standards, making sure that there's a policy in place that says that you know you can you can find you can find the data, you can a access it, uh, it respects your your privacy and 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 transparency. So all that's very important. Uh, the policies around incentives for people using data is really mixed and unclear, and there's conflicting roles in unenforced policies. And that's clearly a challenge area uh, that is a lot of which is outside your control as a farmer, but still needs to be um, addressed. There's also access. Access came when we did the the um, training in Centuria, and we had the participants identify what were the challenges to them in using data and making decisions with, with data on their farms. Access came up by far as the number one issue uh, that, that they had. So can I find this data? Uh, if I can f find it, can I find it w as an open data source so I don't ha have to pay for it? Is it trustworthy? Uh, this came up particularly for mark for market data, uh, and and sometimes uh, data can be can be pushed out to me, and sometimes I have to go and find it and bring it in. So push and pull. But how do I know that? Uh, which which one I I need I need to do? And then can I find ways of sharing uh, data in a low low tech way? Economic challenges include well, can I have access to financing data? What about land ownership and, ten and tenure data? Uh, how, hey, how about apps? There's some great apps. Can I afford to use them even? And what's the economic impact of climate change? So is this inflicting upon me uh, flooding or, or droughts? That's going to change my economic po positioning. And that's really so if I can get data to give me a heads up about that, or I can report data on the impact of on my farm, can I get some? Uh, can I get some help with that? And then a big, a big area is fair recompense for data use. And uh, I believe that GFAR is going to have a whole uh, webinar on on uh, sharing data and, uh, and and the fair standards and what what makes up good policy for data um, transparency and privacy and how does that impact? So that's a whole area in and of itself. Uh, finally, op operational. By this, I mean field operations, right? So, if I, I've got this data, and by and large, I want it to yes, it can get all across the supply chain. Right now, I, I want to look at it just in helping me manage my field and my farm better. So, is this something that I can uh, use? Is it easy to use, or is it difficult? Is it does it t does it take a lot of time to uh, use? So, this is one of the, the areas that that we discovered. Uh, and doing some research with farmers, that time is, is so so precious. If it takes a lot of time to find this data, to use this data, to analyze the data, I'm going to abandon it because it just is not, not worth it. And is the data job oriented? Does it match what I need, the task that I need need to do to solve real problems? Is it accurate? Can I do something with it? Is it actionable? And can I get some expert support? And can I get some peer peer support? Can I look at other farmers who are using this data in a, maybe a same way that I would like like to use it? And then uh, we we can exchange uh, ways to uh, that that data is is being used and how successful or what challenges that we can talk about to, together. And there's quite a few um, there's quite a few. Uh, organizations that sort of pull uh, growers to, together to help with that. So we're going to focus a lot today, though, on the operational side. We could spend a whole, we can spend a series of webinars on any th any one of these. So let's take a look at operations. So where do we even be begin? Because you've got soil, you got weather, you got plant health, you got markets, you got post office, you got to capture data. Maybe there's data around safety and equipment. Oh my heavens, where do we even begin? Well, one, one, one helpful thing is that there are easy to use uh, uh, irrigation apps and other apps. The one on the left uh, is by a group, and I am not endorsing these. I'm just showing you examples of, of what, what, what it is. But there's a, there's a group called uh, Initia, and they will text you. I think it's, you sign up for it, and it's like four cents a day. And they will simply send you an SMN text um, to say, 
here's what the weather is and any alerts about the, the weather. I think this is great because it's a low cost, it's data, right, it's information, and hopefully you can take some action with it, but it's a low cost way, a non-high tech way uh, for you to get good information that's going to be useful for you to say, oh, can I, is this a good day to put on my fertilizer? Is this the right time to harvest, et, et cetera? So it's a really good um, app, I think that's why. Uh, we talked during um, uh, the first webinar uh, uh, that the Virtual Irrigation Academy and Moses, our friend Moses uh, there, uh, they've come up with a very simple irrigation uh, application that just gives you a simple, uh, uses sensors in, in the ground and very simply tells you whether the ground has enough moisture or no, you need to ir irrigate or no, you've overwatered. And uh, uh, so simple applications like this are good for single task, right? These are single task applications. So if you can find these and you just you, you use it for that, it might be a, a good way to start. However, I think, you know, if, if you want, if you start looking beyond that, and, and one, of the, one of the ways I think to organize your, your data is really focus on the jobs that you need to do. What are the tasks that as a farmer you need to get done? So whether it's crop planning, um, uh, you've got to go get your, your seeds and your fertilizers, you have to prep the fields and seed, you have to irrigate and, and manage the crops throughout the growing season, you got to find the best market, you got to harvest and sell and package, uh, uh, you have to evaluate your results, and then use that to provide improvements for your next season. So a good place to start is to say, where are the big jobs, the big tasks I need to do, and which ones am I having problems in? So don't try, uh, one of the mistakes that people often make is try to solve everything with data at one time and you get overwhelmed. So find an area where you are having problems and maybe pick one or two of those to start if you're new to, to using data uh, and get used, get used to it, get a little bit of experience with it, and then move to the next big job, big task that you have to do. I want to mention that uh, we usually think about finding the best market uh, just before we har harvest and sell. I, I think that uh, my, my experience is that there's also coming up with a strategy about what markets you're going to go to and if you're going to brand your, your, your crops or your produce, are you going to work with another brand? And if you're going to look at that way, that's got to be done up front. That actually goes into your 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 business plan, your crop planning, and maybe someday we'll do a whole webinar on that uh, as well. So, um, so you start with your goals and your capabilities, also known as your business plan. This is uh, the slide that you see in front of you now with Anita. Uh, this is something that I use working with companies and with farmers and saying, so where, where do we even start? Well, we create a profile, and you might do your own pro pro profile. So Anita farms uh, in, in Kenya. She wants to get higher profits from her farm uh, uh, through, uh, through selling cut flowers. And she's got some limited knowledge of te technology, uh, though she's comfortable with a laptop and, and smartphones, and she's willing to adopt new practices if not, they're not too time consuming and results are clear. So if you're working with a data, if you're trying to set up a way to work with data to improve your farm, it'd be really good if you actually created your own profile and you were very specific about writing down what is your goal and what's the task that you want to focus on. It gives you clarity to yourself and others working with you is that what are we trying to do? And again, the idea is to hone in where you want to use the data first. So Anita wants to improve the profitability by growing and selling cut flowers. Her priority task was say it could be it could be crop planning, could be this for our purposes here. Her priority task is develop an irrigation plan to optimize water usage and, and fertilization to ensure plant quality and yield. Okay, that's where we're going to focus the data on. And we talk about the basic uh, available equipment and processes that she has, because there's no diff there's no sense of going after data if you don't have the equipment that can use it, right? And she has access. We're going to say in this in this sample, she's got access to someone who's an irrigation consultant. Maybe it's from a university, maybe it's from uh, an agent, 
uh, but we're just going to pretend that she has that. So what, what should she do? Where, where does she start? So once she's completed what she wants to do in her business plan, she, again, we said she needs to prioritize the big jobs to be done and the problems to be solved. So don't try to tackle them all at one time. Prioritize. And then she'll determine what information or an, an analysis that she needs for, for the smaller task to complete that job and find the sources of the data. Which ones are open and free? Which ones might she have to pay for? That would be really important to know. And then map the flow of data. And we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through this with her data pr provider. And finally, analyze the results and make adjustments for the next season or even during, during the season. Let's break down this stuff a little bit more. Okay, so this is a little map that, that you can use to just begin to map the information requirements for e each job. So for her irrigation, this is focused around ir irrigation. If, if this was focused around crop planting or har harvesting, you would see different, different uh, bullet items up here. But for irrigation, she ne needs to get a current weather conditions, a weather forecast, Soil moisture, evapotranspiration, she needs an irrigation schedule and needs to know where her irrigation is placed. And then, so that's in the operations. For, is she may need to record and report um, depending on her particular cir circumstances. We're going to say she does. So where and how much water was applied, if she applied some chemicals or fer fertilizers, which is getting more important with people are looking to say, uh, how much did you use and how much is being run off into other areas? What was your yield and your quality? She's got to manage her equipment. So again, where's her equipment lo location and its status? Is it on? Is it off? Is it in working order? Is it not in working order? Uh, and does she need to do some troubleshooting? And then planning to start, she needs to know, well, what's going on out in the market? Who's buying, who's buying crop, who's, bu who's buying what kind of cut flowers? What are they buying? How soon do I need to, to get it, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of like a first step to say, huh, if this is what I, I want to do, what kind of inf information do I need? We can get more specific with that. So um, we work with uh, growers to say, OK, let's break this down further into, into more, more tasks. So what tasks have to happen for Anita to meet her goal of increasing her profitability Again, this one's based on irrigation, so, but she does have to know how well positioned her fields are for flower growing, right? So she might get some terrain uh, and climate data, and that might come from some satellites uh, uh, um, uh, and, and UAVs and, and drones uh, data, and that might come from an online open da database. It might come from a data service provider and et, et cetera. So, um, and I got, I have a spinning wheel here. Oh, sorry, I hope my PowerPoint's not going to quit on me. Uh, so, so you can go down for each major task and say, what information do I need to complete for that task? Where does it come from? Who's is, who's it going to? And then, uh, where and what am I going to do with it? So this is a nice little matrix that you could fill out. Again, saying. Uh, and it could be working, uh, you could take a cut yourself, you could work with your data pro provider, but really you're trying to map out pretty specifically what's the, inf or first again, where are the tasks that you need to do? So focus first on the job to be done. Focus first on what you need to get done, then look at the in information that you need, and then what kind of data is going to support that. So now that you have that, you can say, so how, how am I actually going to map the flow of information more, more who's it going to and from? And this is a, this is a, a gateway we, we develop what we call core, core documents, which is an easy way to, to really think about what information that you need. So we start with you, the farmer, and maybe you're working with a consultant and an agronomist, and you create your crop plan, and you're going to share that with, with the agronomist. And then you say, okay, uh, I need to, we need to do some scouting because we need to know what's happening in the, in the field. Oh, okay, so we're going to get some observations and, me and measurements. We might get the current weather. We might uh, get a weather for forecast. We're going to look at the soil. Uh, we're going we're to look at all, all those things that, from an agronomy point of view, 
uh, we need to, to, to support. And that agronomist says, okay, farmer, I'm gonna give you a, rec a recommendation. Now that might, recommendation might come as just talking with you, it might come as an email, it might come with the, um, with that little irrigation tool, but there's some, something that says, here's the re recommendation of when and how you need to, to irrigate. Ah, okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna send a work order to the irrigation controller. It could be a drip irrigation, it could be a center pivot irrigation, we don't care. It's gonna say, here's how much water I want you to apply uh, uh, over these crops during this amount of time. That gets ir ir irrigated, ir irrigated, and what hopefully what uh, a lot of manufacturers now are setting up that you can actually get a record of what happened with that. So if you need to report that uh, either to um, some local government uh, uh, group or maybe your supply chain, maybe the, the people who you're, you're, you're selling to are starting to say, hey, we need to know, we need to report, uh, our market wants to know what you did with water, what you did with fertilizer, what you did with, with this and that. You have a way to actually capture that as data and report that. So, so again, what you wanna look to is this all works in a cycle around a job to be done. Some of that data is gonna be on site, right? It's gonna be at your field, again, things like the soil moisture, the field mapping. Uh, you might have a local weather station uh, you might uh, have sen other sensors in, in, in your field. Uh, you might have a pumping station and your water lines. You might have nozzles or uh, whatever. All those are, are part of what's on, on the field. But a lot of offsite data all, you also have to get, right? So again, this is an example around an irrigation de decision support system. So it needs to get some, uh, uh, not just what's going on in the field, what, what regionally is happening with weather, uh, soil texture, uh, maybe some satellite or drone imagery. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Also, uh, just general data about that particular crop that you are, are, are growing. What does that crop need? What's, where are the risks associated with that? Uh, what fertilizers might you need? And when do you need to, to, to do that? You may have, again, you may have an agronomist, someone from, from uh, a, a field agent come out and work with you as a consultant. Uh, you might have water resource constraints, particularly if you're in South Africa right now. I mean, that's obviously going on. So me, you may need then to report how much water is going on. And, and all this should, will flow to you as a farmer to make decisions. So there's a lot of, again, you can see there's a lot of pieces that need to come to, together for you to make some decisions about even simply how you're going to irrigate your fields. And this is, the idea with data is that you can make better and better decisions because you have more, more information to work with. So again, you might have some open source tool. We talked about these in, in the first session. Uh, there's open source soil and land capability maps. It may or may not exist in your area. This is one of the, the issues. They exist in some places, but not everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of open source weather and climate data and there's even some open source farm management tools. Uh, one I found is um, plantvillage.org. Uh, this is something that uh, they have where I live. Uh, I live uh, near, to, I live in the state of Oregon in the US, but right by the state of, of Washington. And the folks there um, will send you, uh, particularly uh, uh, Rachel out there will send you, she will text you information about what's going on with, uh, with the crops out there. So they're saying, hey, it's almost planting time. You should be looking at your plant and look to see if it might be infected with, with a pathogen uh, d disease. So that's very, that's very, very helpful. So if you have un university or government extensions uh, that can help, help you with this, try and f find it out because they can actually just send you a text message or an email to say, look out, look out, here's what's coming up. So those, those are great uh, resources for, for you to have. Uh, but let's look more at what's going on in the field. So again, uh, in our irrigation example, we need to know on the field, the field data we wanna get is our soil texture, our soil moisture, uh, the temperature in the field, uh, what kind of plant regulation do we need? So how much water is, do, do we want for this, for, for this plant? 
uh, what, what's healthy, how do we measure that. We talked a lot about that uh, in the first session about um, what uh, data to use for plant available water, how much uh, evapotranspiration is going on, what's the wind do doing for that in a particular can canopy of the plant, are we getting rainfall, what's the temperature, how much sunshine are we getting, oh my heavens, all this needs to come together if you're going to really optimize around your, your irrigation. Um, one thing you might look at using is, uh, and we're seeing this, uh, there's an increased use of drones, or also known as U U UAVs. Uh, don't know if you're using these yet. I think the price is going to come, come down. Uh, maybe farm associations would, uh, would band together to get one. Here in the U.S., you have to have a, a license to, um, uh, to, to fly them. They give you, uh, they're sort of really good for up close looking at a, a crop, but they're sort of, if, for more than a, a few fields, they start getting expensive to uh, use. So the main idea here is that you can get a lot closer, a lot better imagery on particular plants in your field with a drone, uh, but it's expensive. And but they're very good also for tracking herds and flocks. Uh, if you use a satellite, which you pay for a, a service, it's great if, for large tracts of, of land, but the spatial resolution is much more limited, less expensive to use, but you're not going to, you're, but you're not going to get as detailed information. So, um, so just just a note on the on those two if you happen to be looking into them. Uh, they, they each have their advantages, uh, and you just have to choose to see which one works going to work for, for you. If you have a very large farm. You, you, the satellite will be an inexpensive way to, to look uh, in general what's happening. If you want to look up more closely at a field and particular plants, then your UAV or drone is, will be the way to go. And once they take that imagery, it's got to be uploaded to a server that can interpret that and give you back information about it. Um, there's also supporting data. So when you, particularly if you interact with a company, um, uh, they have reference data about their equipment, so it's, um, uh, we say it's all instances of a thing. So you might say, here's, I don't know, my, co my, my colleague uh, Andres made this up, the Acme Max Supertron 200. That just means there's a piece of equipment, it might be a tractor, it might be a piece of irrigation equipment, and that's, that's, that's what it's called. But then there's a particular instance of this thing. Um, uh, where it is, maybe it's a serial number, but it also includes things like uh, uh, setup data includes grower data, so it might be your farm, your field, where you are located, that would all be in what we call setup data. Uh, it might be also your equipment setup data, what equipment, what specific equipment do you have, uh, what serial number again does it, does, does it have. So if you bought uh, uh, an aerometer uh, set of uh, sensors, uh, but you bought this particular set of them, and now you're saying, well, they're located in this field and they're on or off, so con con configuration data. The first two are very general data, and they get to more spe specific because configuration data is how you have configured it out in your, in, in your field. So when you're working with a data support system, when you're working with a con consultant, this is some of the kind of data that they will be looking for, and they may come to you to find it. So some of this data, lots of people will be looking for, particularly the reference data of something that, that the, ma the manufacturer pr provide and what you, what, and your setup data. So where's your farm? Who are you? Who's in charge? What's the role? Uh, what's the field boundaries? Well, you could be entering that lots and lots of times. And the idea is that you want to create something where it has it once and then save and, and copy it in, otherwise you'll be spending endless hours uh, filling that information o over and over. So if you're working with a data service provider, find a way that they, they, can, they can have you enter it once and not multiple times. And that's one of the advantages of having da data standards is once you do that, then it can be shared across m multiple systems without you having to take the time to go and re-enter it again and again. Okay, here's a fun map. Now we're going to get very, 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 very specific. So 
when we work between growers and data pr providers, we actually use this thing called a business process planning and notation flowchart, BPMN. You don't have, have to use this, but it'll tell you very specific about how our approach is. So we have these things called swim lanes, and we have one for the grower, one for a consultant, and one for a data pro provider. And so again, we're gonna use our irrigation um, uh, example and look to see how the information, how the data needs to, uh, to flow. So we start saying, okay, I'm the grower. I need to share the crop plan with the consultant. Okay, the consultant got the crop plan. And now the, the consultant says, okay, I need to go get some observation and measurement, O and M data. I gotta find out and I have to analyze it and I have to create a rec recommendation. I need to go to a data pr provider and request that. And so that data provider up in the clouds somewhere got it and, re and received it and they say, okay, here comes all of, of the data. We're gonna, we, maybe we, we capture your sensor data, your, we have weather data, we got offsite crop data for you. You've sent us your field data and other data, and now we're gonna send that back to you, the consultant. You're gonna put that together and analyze it and determine if a recommendation is needed to the grower, to the farmer. And uh, you're also gonna, with that, you're gonna be looking at, so what happened last season? So you're gonna tap into a historical record. That's gonna help you analyze the data and then create a, rec a recommendation, send that to the farmer. The farmer say, great, I, I like that or no, I, I wanna change that, but if I like it, I'm gonna create my work order and send that to the irrigation system. When you are actually working with a data, when you get down to, the, to working with data pr providers, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of map that they like to work with. It looks very complex here, but it's really all about just tracking what is going on in the whole whole system. So you may or may not want to um, work with your, your con consultant or service provider, but if you do, this will give you a really, really clear idea about where is this data coming from? How am I getting it? What's happening to whom? And exactly how it's going, going to work. So uh, maybe more complex than what you, than what you, what you need, but if you really want to map out where data is going to and from, this is a great process to use for that. And again, it's called a BPM flowchart. There are books on how to, to use this and you can do it on paper. Uh, uh, you can make a much more sim simpler map. Again, we had that matrix that we showed before. This is just a visual example of that, of that, ma of that matrix, but it really is saying where is data flowing. Uh, uh, again, you, you can sort of look at the kind of the kind of analysis that you you would do, and what kind of uh, questions it, it would, would it would answer. And again, the idea is to be not just to use data, but to be intentional about your use of data. So, um, unfortunately, uh, the more you go from examining what happened to going to prescription, so what should we do now? Uh, Typically, unless you are right, you can do it yourself. If you hire someone in to help you through through that data, or you're doing a data decision support system, costs on doing that tend to go up. So that's that's unfortunate, but that's just the, the, the nature of it. It gets more more complex, and as it gets more com complex, then costs tend to go up. So again, what you might want to do is to figure out what kind of data can you share with other farmers who, who are maybe in your area. Maybe you have a trade asso association, a farmer's association, and some of this data across fields, uh, particularly with, with what's going on with, with the climate and the weather, maybe there's uh, some pathogens in the soil there, that are, are being sh shared. Then you can maybe pull your resources together and get some analysis uh, that was spread across uh, several farms and you can share that cost and that cost burden. Okay, next slide. And tell, and tell me what it is, because. <laughs> uh, there are some reminders. Start with the end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Take small just steps. Three, just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I not see. No, no, no. Okay, just keep, keep reading through, through them because I, I can't even get to my printout. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Okay, so some reminders. The first one is start with the end goal in mind. Prioritize mm -hmm. the information you need. Match your data search to those goals. 
look for data that can reduce your risks. And then the second one is take small steps. Yes. And so, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so do you want me to read the other two? Sure. Don't lose the agronomy when using new technology and data. Use ground truthing to check and fine tune. And then use yes. social media to get ideas and answers from other farmers and or experts. And, and, and again, there's, there's been a lot of uh, work uh, and a lot of associations uh, that you, you can go Google and find uh, just ways that uh, there are different groups that you can go and just qu query them as to what, what you might ask a question. So when, when do I know is time to harvest cassava? I don't know. And and they have they'll have a, a a way they'll have experts there to help an answer the, those questions. So that's a very easy way to use some information. So let's go to what's the next slide? The next go one is further. sharing facilities, processes, and data. Yeah. So again, uh, you want to uh, wherever wherever you can um, uh, do that. And I know that uh, uh, Valera is going to be offering uh, a webinar on the 5th of April on the importance of farmers. Association, so that webinar will t will go into much more d detail around this idea, and I highly recommend uh, if you are a smallholder farmer attend that one and really think about how you can work with farmers in your area. So again, it's going to be on April fifth. Yeah, okay. I will put the link in the chat later. Okay. Yeah. Next slide. Yes, partner to integrate strategies across the value chain. Yeah. So again, particularly if you're working as a as a, uh, a farmers association, uh, that's where uh, you can gain some uh, strength and look to see how 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 can you not just sell into the su supply chain, but how you can influence those supply chain your, yourselves. So next slide. Yes. Brands help customers in three major ways. Okay. So. Let's go back to, to this a little bit. We, we talked before that if you wanted to think about how, how you're going to position yourself, your crop, if you're just selling your, your, your crop on the lowest price, that's fine. But if you want to add more, more value, then you want to think about either maybe trying to brand your, 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 your produce, and it might be not just with yourself, but again, with others in your area. And so let's talk, so brand can help uh, uh, customers find what 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 they want and know it's a safe buy, so it can also reassure assure them, and it can connect, it can engage with them, it can connect with them. And so, um, if you go to the next slide, yes, all yeah. those bullet points there are. So, are there ways that you can you can talk about what you grow, can you position it in, in the market? And it might be to the people that you're selling to. Uh, uh, are you local or you're or organic? Do you have a special taste? Uh, all of, of these things, all those bullet points, is there something that makes your produce, your product stand out in a way that is different and something that you can talk about? And sometimes you can be an ingredient, what we call an ingredient brand in another pr product. And if you hit the next button down, yeah, you should see. Uh, okay, so so here in, in the U.S. we have a type of onion that's grown only in uh, the state of, of Georgia. It's called Vidalia. It's a very sweet uh, sweet onion. They position that onion as being unlike any other onion. And so and so now you have a brand of potato chips that's using not just putting a, an onion flavor, but they're saying, oh, we use Vidalia onions. And so now that has more a, appeal. So so now I can, if I'm selling Vidalia onions, I'm selling them for more. And as a, as, as a customer in a store, if I go to, to, my, uh, to the aisle that has onions in them, I'm gonna pay more for Vidalia onion because they have higher value. They may not taste different to one from one person to the next, but they've been able to position this as a better onion and then command a higher price. So that's the entire idea there. So what's next? Uh, the one with positioning was the one that you already finished, correct? Yeah, right. So, yeah, now we have just the photo with success by one leads others to try. Okay. So, uh, so we're just about <laughs> at the end. Yeah. See, so you see, so success here is is also depend upon 
your your colleagues to, to help you out. So yeah, so so what so what we 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 find that if if one farmer uh, has seen some success. We've seen it particularly in using new bits of, of, of technology because, again, um, we find that if you are um, a farmer and you, uh, you know, you want to say, hey, did, so, did I see someone else I know tr try this? Did it work for them? If so, then I'm, I'm going to be more willing to, to try it. So come, come together, share ideas, share new technologies, Focus it on the uh, task at hand, and go ahead. Okay, the next one is the digital agricultural market model. Oh boy, okay. Uh, <laughs> you want me to load all the the animations, all the the pieces, or? Uh, uh, no, that's, that's fine. So, so, so we we start with we start with the farmer, and I'm going to see if I I can do this all from memory. And you have some you have some some data, some of which is coming on on the farm. Some of which is coming from maybe an offsite provider, and some is coming from the field. All right. So if you hit the next one, yes. So you have all these different pieces of data that need to come to come together in order to make to make a de de decision, and that requires an integration of bringing those to together, and then some useful apps so that you you can use it. Right. So you have. Uh, and this is this is the the pro this is why some of the companies are trying to merge to, together to try to do to, to to focus on this. But it's not as easy as as it appears. So go ahead and push the uh, next one. Yes. And that is what did I just say? The um, is that the top roof? Yeah, this is the the blue background saying available, integrated, and easy to use apps. Right. Right. So again. Uh, uh, we have, there's a lot of data out, uh, out there. There are fewer apps that can actually be very helpful, and this is what folks are working on. So, so someone tries to sell, sell you some data, you've got to look for a way that, that you can use it. So look for app applications. Now, the people who build the data, the data systems, they want to say all this data all needs to come together because, and, because it makes our job easier if we can put all this data together. Well, that's fine for for them. For you, you got to be able, able to use it. So that's why I emphasize applications because it's got to be in a way that matches the task again that you are doing. And then finally, uh, push again. It's got to come into. It's got to fit yes. into uh, your cultural norms, the way that you farm, the way that uh, your your group farms, and all that needs to come together. So it's not a simple thing of just going and selling. Um, uh, a, a tool to, to to you. A lot of pieces need to come together, and that's that's the point of the slide. It's what we call a complex market m model, and uh, just all this has, has to come together. Which is why I think there's going to be some more work being done in this space. Okay, next. Yes, that's the final one. <laughs> okay, we did it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Ben. Um, the first question we got. Uh, was about market adoption. Yes. This person said um, farmers, low-income smallholder farmers are the biggest market um, and they have the least interest in technology. How can I penetrate and make them buy more of my product? Okay, again, so it has, it's a good, good question and I, I'll go back to um, that area, what we call the bowling alley in the, in the, in the market adoption model. So if you can make it, um, uh, make sure that it's solving a real problem that they have. It's, and so if you've not gone out and observed them, um, I actually think the best way is to go out and spend time and observe them and see where they're spending time, where they're finding difficulty, and making sure that your product addresses that need and start with that, that problem focus. And and uh, and then obviously you, you would you would tout the the way that your product can help solve those problems, uh, and then uh, it's got to be affor affordable. Affordable might be maybe in payment installments. Uh, it might be that it's just a, a a price that that they they can afford. Maybe you lease it. Maybe you work through the uh, the extension agents, and obviously they 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 need to know about it. So you might also consider providing some free knowledge 
with that you might be able to pr provide them either with um, uh, an SMS text or pamphlets or things that can help also uh, help help them, but also know that, that help them know that you're there to help them, and um, uh, and 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 finally make sure again that your product is a whole product that it had that if they need support with it, if they need documentation with it. Uh, if they need some training with it, if they need some other, if it needs to work with some other products, it's all there, so they don't ha they don't have to go find it someplace else. Hope that helps. We can talk offline more. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here from Anthony and Reshma. They say, what book and software tool for drawing BPMN flowcharts would you recommend? Uh, there is actually a uh, a book. Uh, if you just Google um, B BPM BPMN notation, uh, you will find uh, books on it, and um, uh, there's several uh, that you can download onto um, a reader. And the I think the I will I will put into the chat. I don't have it here with with me, with me now. I will. Follow up with with Valera and give you the specific uh, name of the one that I use, uh, and we use for for the model that we use. We use a product called Gliffy, but you can use any software product that allows you just to do some. Just what 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 you do is they usually have some shapes that match um, these these different uh, icons for date databases and send email. We use what's called Gliffy, G-L-I-F-Y. Uh, it might be two Fs in there, and uh, that's uh, that's a program that we use. It's not in inexpensive, and we have a group of people that sh that share it. So um, that's but that's one that that we use. But again, we we lower our costs because we have a whole whole group of people that use it. Oh, Dan, I'm seeing that some people are mentioning Visual. Uh, Visual is good. Visual. Yes. Yes, my, my Microsoft Visual will, will work. Yes, if, okay. If, if, if you have that, yep, work works well. Again, the idea is just to just to the the important part is is thinking through of it, right? The important part is is thinking through of how you are sending the, the data and where is it coming from. And one thing I think I, I would I would probably add to, to this one that we haven't done is. Which and maybe by by color, which ones are free and which one cost? That would probably be something that we would we should add to this and be <laughs> worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, this person says champions usually encourage others. Are there packaged case study templates that can facilitate sharing successes gained? Um, are you looking for the the template itself, or are you looking for the case studies? And so, if you're looking for case studies, um, you can you can. There's different templates, but but usually it starts with um, uh, the problem the the problem that that the the group or the person or the farmer or group of farmers was facing. What were the off, uh, obstacles to, to to that? And then what what did you try? And what and what were the goals of that? What were the objectives of uh, of trying that? So. What part of the problem or all of the problem were, were you trying to, to to solve? What were the results and what were the rec recommendations that come out of that? Uh, so tip so typically, if you're a private company, uh, you're trying to tout why your product worked in this particular case case study. Uh, if you're not, then you if you're just doing a, a uh, case study, um, we usually do. Um, uh, we we also then would add were there any outside trends that were impacting that, uh, and then what are what happened, and what are the recommendations and next steps going forward? So what are the implications of what of what you did in in the, in the case study, and very importantly, what are the next steps that you would recommend? Whether it's a change in practice, it's a change in policy. Or is a change? Uh, it's a recommendation of of adoption of this, this practice by by others. That's a very important part to add. Okay. Which way do you think is better to disseminate information for farmers? Web pages, SMS, etc. My my answer to that is depends on the farmer. So find out find out from the farmer. 
um, what because it depends on what a access they have. Now, I think for it also depends on the type of information that you're looking at. So if it's a simple one line item that farmers can get and it's immediate, like the weather, like the weather up, uh, update, send it by text. If it's if it's like here's all the information about this this crop and the crop co coefficients, or here's the, the diseases that you want to be on on the lookout for, or here's the market, um, then you're going to want to uh, send uh, either email or have a web page. Uh, the web pages tend tend to be more you know are not always updated as quickly. Uh, but I think a lot of the groups that have that are more on, ongoing groups that have discussion topics can be good. They may not be as timely. So again, it depends on the the need, the amount of, uh, of data, and what existing technologies the f farmer has. So so quick messages, alerts, S SMS. More you've got, you're going to want to rely on email or web pages. And. Um. Done. Thank you so much. If we will publish everything, and we will have two new webinars soon. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, Charles. Bye bye. bye, -bye.